Okay, here you go. Um, okay. Is there anything magical here? Or? Uh, well, you can just use that with like the space bar to change slides. Sure, it's okay. Uh, Okay. There we go. okay, let me give you an introduction here. So welcome, those of you who are here and those of you who are online. I appreciate you coming today to our brown bag. We are very lucky to have uh, Dr. Tom Manick from chemistry, who is going to talk to us about from monkeypox to oyster restoration, solving real world as a teaching tool. And uh, is there any way you can get off the dinghy? Uh, well, you can escape on your keyboard. Escape. I think I may have left my stuff open, and you can just get rid of that. Thank you. All right. Well, I will turn it over to you as soon as he gets back online there. There we go. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. I looked that way for the camera, right? <laughs> and so, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our projects, eight or nine of them that we have ongoing. Um, I'll give a little philosophy first. So first, I'm a big fan of when we do projects, right? We engage people. We don't just tell them what they have to do, right? It's not a dictatorship, really. Um, there's going to be lots of work, um, but I'm not, I've learned not to be anal or judgmental about every little detail, right? And I'll, Past experience, I remember someone here many years ago had like a 69.8 average in a class. They needed the class to graduate. The teacher wouldn't budge. They had to come back the next semester and take another class. And I'm thinking of that as a parent and as a student. And I thought that just they remember that for the rest of their life, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just thought this situations you just kind of let go and you roll with it. Um, big fan of we the students working with me read a lot, right? So that's very very important. I don't just put them in a lab to do repetitive tasks over and over. Um, and so they learned lots of things. For example, in the last year, we've been in three different business plan competitions. So students learn about the business aspects of their projects. Um, there's cultural aspects, uh, tech, and they learn about technical, regulatory. I'm talking about oyster restoration. We're dealing with the state and a, a state and a federal agency now. And those things all you have to do well in order for your project to work. Um, I try to make it social and possible. Usually when you have two or three people that get along and they work together well, it's a lot more enjoyable than working by yourself. Uh, you know, and then some people like working by themselves, but usually the, the groups that work the best, it's usually two or three people that get along really well. Um, and it's not just studying. So a lot of times you take a class and you study and you learn about something that's great, but we're trying to solve a problem. So there's a real problem there and we want to solve it, right? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about is the kind of problems that we've been working on. Okay, so let me tell you about a project we did in the fall. Um, my medicinal chemistry class. So in that, I don't just teach them medicine. As I say, memorize, memorize, memorize. I teach them how to design medicines, how they get tested, et cetera. And so the project that we did this year was focused on coming up with new drugs for monkeypox, right? So pox is a general name for a group of viral infections. The most famous one is smallpox. Um, smallpox has decimated humanity, humanity until 1975 when it was eradicated. But from 1900 to 1975, it killed 300 million people on the planet. Okay, and it's a it's an agonizing death, right? So, uh, you know, far and away a million times worse than anything we saw with COVID. COVID, there was a lot of questions: Did they really die from COVID, or was it the stage four lung cancer they had type of thing? And a lot of that came up. Um, and so we went through the whole process of designing drugs. And then we went through the application. We applied to the National Institutes of Health to have our drug tested. Um, I've dealt with that. That's the infectious diseases uh, portion of it. I've had um, drugs accepted during the past antibiotics, so they knew me fairly well, and, we, and those drugs performed well. Um, and so we went through, provided them all the data, and went and got accepted. And in December, we ended up shipping basically 12 variations of our compounds up to NIH for testing. And so they're going to go through a bunch of, uh, they've already started going through a bunch of testing against monkeypox and cowpox. And if they work out well, then they might move over to smallpox. And the reason that they're looking at smallpox now is, is because it's a weapon for bioterrorism, right? And if you have something that's that infectious and that deadly, and you're a country that cannot make an aircraft carrier or make a jet, and you can make smallpox, you know, what you, you have an incredible weapon, right? And so that's, you know, a big concern now. 
Um, and so that the students went through this with me, right? And now we'll say some stuck closer than others, um, but it was a fantastic experience. Uh, in the fall, a couple of students gave a talk, another student gave a poster, and then in, I guess, roughly a month or two, uh, they'll be up in the Capitol building giving a presentation there about their work with that. So that's kind of as applied and problem solving as you get, because when we do this, that there's not like a special section that you get to apply from small schools or anything like that. We go to NIH, they're dealing with you know other countries, they're dealing with major corporations, they're dealing with major research universities. And so you kind of have to make your way in there with having some good stuff. Okay, so another project I'll talk about is oysters. And oysters are not food for us, they are environmental engineering, okay? Um, and so three big thing about oysters is that they prevent shoreline erosion, which in this era of increasing storms is a really big deal. There's been a lot of places where storms have hit that used to have oyster bars and they would have been fine, but now they don't have oyster bars, so things just slide into the ocean. Second is they're what they call keystone species, right? So there's a lot of things in the ocean that live on or around an oyster bar for protection, particularly like young crabs, young fish, things like that. Um, and so worldwide oyster populations are down 90%. So that has, has a real impact on our fisheries. Um, and then the third thing is that they filter water. So one adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. Um, and so you think of an oyster bar that's say half a mile long, has millions of oysters. That's an unbelievable water purification plant that humans could not build if they tried, okay? So the thing with oysters now to bring them back, you have to have a material that will attract their larvae that's in the water column and then allow them to grow. And there's a lot that goes into that, a lot of chemistry. So our, our approach is very different than how the biologists do. So biologists always, they get bags or dump trucks loads of oyster shells, dump them, and then they hope the oyster spat that's in the water will grow on them. The problem with that approach is that if you have to do, say, 10 miles, there's just not enough oyster shells out there, right? It's a very limited supply to use. Because once an oyster bar goes dormant, the reality is it gets covered with soot and it sinks, and then it's basically all gone, right? So you can't go out and get stuff. And so with this, we've also, we got approval. We went through with me and the students working with me in December. We got approval from the state of Florida um, to do an a, a, a oyster bar as a demonstration on how our material works so other people can copy it. And right now it's up in front of the Army Corps of Engineers, right? So, which is a national type thing. And just to give an example, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, right, has Virginia and Maryland. Their oyster populations are down 99% than what they were 150 years ago. The Army Corps of Engineers has a unit there that's trying to restore oyster populations, right? And so it, it's, it, it, there's a lot of reasons for that that have to do with national defense, as well as people getting sick from bad water, you know, declining real estate value, and which means declining taxes. There's a lot of things that work their way into that decision to put, you know, a, a bunch of the Army Corps engineers there to try to bring them back. But their annual budget right now is $135 million. And they project that they're going to spend up to two billion dollars to try to bring the oysters there back. So it's not just like a small project. We want to demonstrate to kind of the big boys and see if they'll adapt our technology. Um, so this is uh, Paige Bland is a student that was in my 1211 class um, last semester, and I announced to the class, "Hey, I'm going to do something with puzzles. If you're interested, stop by. That's my my sophisticated recruiting tool." Paige was the only one that stopped by, so she's now on um, her, I guess you call it a publication, because there is an editor and then reviewers. So every time we submit one of these, we're, we're doing all the Nobel Prizes from 1900 to 2020 in 10-year segments, right? And so the puzzles introduce students to what those different Nobel laureates won their prizes for in the sciences. Um, and so, and we also give some background on the history, um, and then about every two weeks, they publish one on their website that people worldwide use. The first one we put up had about 4,000 downloads, right? So it's mostly high school teachers, maybe college teachers that will use them in a class. Um, and so that's, you know, student involved, right? It's unique in a way that if you look at our clues, they're pretty chunky. There's, you know, three or four facts in there rather than just like, you know, five words that you might see like in the New York Times crossword. So it's there to teach. It's not just there to be kind of hard. Um, and we actually kicked off these puzzles during COVID you see the one on the left that was published and we came up with uh, it has about 170 infectious diseases in it um, a bunch of students including Taylor who's online right now worked with me we all did this by computer you know, everyone was homebound type of thing 
Um, we came up with this unique type of puzzle, and they ended up publishing, and they got downloaded a whole bunch of times. And that whole thing, and that was worldwide. So that was designed to teach people about an infectious diseases. So, uh, and again, it has you know, these clues that give you a lot of information about disease. So when you read the clue, you're learning something, and then you just have to find where it fits in. So, um, so we have been for roughly 20 years been developing a new type of cancer drug. We've had 22 of them start preclinical trials at the National Cancer Institute, right? And so this is just an example of a data set we get back, right? You can see it does nine different types of cancer from leukemia to breast cancer. Um, and then it, it has, it does a total of 60 cell lines and five concentrations at the 60 cell lines. So that one analysis, which was one phase for that particular drug, has about 300 experiments built into it, right? And it gives you an evaluation of your drug. And so the reason we're on number 22 is because a lot of our drugs have worked well. Um, and so what makes this different? So most cancer drugs you take are poisons, right? They go, the goal is to kill more cancer cells than healthy cells. Uh, what we do is we target the cancer cells. A cancer cell will use up to 15 times more energy than a healthy cell. Right? So that means it consumes a lot more nutrients. And it also needs more building blocks because basically they live forever, right? So a cancer cell doesn't die off. It just keeps multiplying, 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 right? And so what we do is we actually feed the cancer cell. We make it grow faster than it wants to. And then that makes it very susceptible to us putting the drug inside it, right? It's kind of like a Trojan horse effect, right? So they're so greedy. We're trying to take advantage of that greed rather than just kill, kill, kill. And then that way we can use a fraction of the dose that other cancer drugs have to use, right? And so this is where we have three drugs up there right now at NCI, which is part of NIH outside Washington. Um, and then after that, we're going to write a proposal to, to narrow it down to just pancreatic cancer because there's nothing out there for pancreatic cancer. Right? So this is a different type of cancer drug, um, different mindset. We can make them here, but we also collaborate a lot. So that's a critical point, right? So we've done a lot of analysis with UGA and uh, uh, Texas A&M and the National Magnet Lab. Um, so we always have collaborators involved in this, okay? And I will point out what's really good about this, if you go through and spend a lot of time in the literature for drug development, companies, research teams are getting nailed from time to time because they fabricated data. Why are they fabricating data? Because there's a lot of money to be made at pharmaceuticals, right? And so they, you know, they, they wax this, this piece of data gets lost, things like that. Uh, we have an independent government agency that's the gold standard to do it, all our evaluation. So no one can ever say, well, you made that up or even think that because it's independent. Um, and a lot of people won't do the independent thing. They just want to do it themselves. Yes? Um, have you ever heard of DIPG? DIPG? Uh, no. It's a type of cancer. It's a brain cancer. No. Uh, I will say this. When we do this, just because that's a good question in a way, um, so I don't study like the cancer itself, right? Mm -hmm. Everything we do is we make a molecule that will attack some molecule inside the cancer cell. So that's our whole thing. It's kind of like, you want to attack that, now how do we get there? So we're, we're by no means doctors, if you went through and said this, you know, six different types of carcinomas that can happen on your throat, I would not know them. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me to look at a carcinoma cell and say, how would you attack that on a molecular level? That's what you end up doing. Oh, okay. so, so it's a difference. So there's the healthcare part, and then there's making a chemical that would kill it for it. So kind of two different things. Okay. So, all right, so let me talk about this a little bit. So I do this thing, I did it in 1211 with the class. I've done it for years. Um, and I call it like when you do it in 1211, it's GPS. So I give everybody, if they want to do it for extra credit, um, you know, I give them a GPS coordinate and they have to go there and answer questions. And a simple analogy would be, um, like if I gave them a GPS cord and they went to somewhere that has some, some woods and a creek and there's a place on campus like this. And so what they would have to do is first is download an app or use an app that they already have that will identify uh, a total of 10 plants and or bugs and or fish creatures that are in that ecosystem, identify them. Um, then they have to, like, for example, the tree, they have to write out the structure of cellulose, right? A lot of people know trees and they know the cellulose, but they don't know anything about the chemistry. Um, then they'd have to write out the drugs called, I mean, not the drugs, the molecules called terpines that the chem that, that pine tree uses to defend itself against algae and fungi and squirrels eating it and who knows what, and what's that chemical defense. 
then they had to go to the creek and they'd have to do some stuff there, right? So maybe part of the creek is they'd have to draw a map from the point you're at right there to how do they get to the Mexico, how do they get to the Gulf of Mexico by water, right? So a lot of people are map illiterate, right? Or they, their geography skills are really weak. So if nothing else, they'll spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes drawing, you know, looking at a map and then drawing out a map, how you get from that point, say next to the PE center down to the Gulf of Mexico, um, where, where the Swanee River hits the Gulf, right? And so they go through all these little towns, they go past all these massive farms. Um, there's a bunch of other rivers that join in, there's springs that they have to identify. And so it kind of gives them a little geography, right? So there's a lot of geography literacy now, right? And I know that because I've done things with maps, not in chemistry, but in my environmental chem, I give them a map. And I say identify the states, and like you'll see Texas identified as Florida, and Florida identified as Alaska because it's off in a corner by itself. And then someone will tell me Alaska is an island because it's always in a box by itself. I mean, it's just a lot of things that come up with geography literacy. And so it, that's not going to cure it, but it, at least it makes me feel a little less guilty. Um, we also do tours at Key West with that. I've done, I've taken classes down in Florida Keys where we do marine science stuff for a week, stay in tents. And one of the ways is we go into Key West for a day. I don't want students just roaming around Key West for a day because bad things can happen, especially if they're into the night. And so they have this GPS tour where they have to hit 10 different spots and do the same type of thing. But this is more, it ends up being a little chemical, a lot cultural. So they'll go say to Ernest Hemingway's house. They have to go into Ernest Hemingway's house, take the picture with the cats, take the picture with this, with that. Then they have to answer some question about famous Ernest Hemingway books. Then they have to answer some question about Ernest Hemingway's time in Cuba. Um, maybe a couple of questions about Old Man and Sea. I think it's his best book, but who knows? Um, and so now they know something about Ernest Hemingway. They'll leave there. They'll go to the turtle. Um, there's a turtle museum. They have to answer questions about the chemical composition of a turtle's shell. You know, uh, where does this type of turtle lay all its eggs? What's its time of year? You know, and then something about the aspect of how they used to hunt turtles, right? And so they tour. And they go and say, U.S. Maine has a memorial. What's the U.S. Maine? Where did it happen? How many men were killed? You know, what was the politics? So as they go around Key West, rather than hitting bars and T-shirt shops and, you know, and whatnot, um, drunk, middle-aged drunk men, you know, all that, the whole thing. Now, now they had to hit, like, these 10 spots. So they get the whole tour in, but they're having a lot of fun on it, right? The other thing I'll do with them is we go out in a boat, right? We'll go out on a catamaran. We, we don't have a boat. We go out with somebody. And they'll spend half a day on a coral reef, right? So for a lot of the students, it's the first time in the ocean, first time in a boat on the ocean, first time on a coral reef. A lot of, I'll usually have three or four little GoPro cameras with me so everybody can take pictures and they get pictures of this and that. And so that ends up being you know, just an incredible experience that you could never do in a classroom with a PowerPoint slide, right? And so that GPS thing and its term is NDD, Nature Deficit Disorder, right? There's a lot of um, issues that people have when they don't spend enough time outside. Right. And it's kind of very well documented, well understood, but still a lot of people spend a lot of time inside in front of screens. Right. And that impacts you uh, mentally and intellectually over time. Um, so let me talk about this one. So this is there are drugs. In, uh, let me give you a, a couple of statistics and a, and a big drop of seawater is up to 1 million bacteria and up to 10 million viruses. Right. So drop of seawater, you'll say teaspoonful. Right, there can be millions of bacteria and tens of millions of viruses naturally in there. It's just the way it is. Those bacteria have to defend themselves against that viruses as well as other things in the ocean. So they emit chemicals. That's how they do it. They, they can't punch you. They can't kick you. They can't bite you. They emit a chemical defense system to keep everything away from them. What we do is now what people will have done in the past is um, they would go to say a coral or they would go to a jellyfish or they would go to you know, some other sessile invertebrate, take it back to the lab, extract it, see what drugs are there, and then try to grow them. What we're doing is we're doing this as a discovery process and as a production process where we actually grow bacteria in the ocean and then we harvest it and bring it back to the lab, right? So we don't decimate anything. We don't have to be near a coral reef. I mean, it, we don't have to be near you know, where there's a whole bunch of sponges. Sponges are great forms of, uh, you know, chemical diversity, lots of drugs in them. That's why lots of things don't eat, eat the sponges. And we can go places that you can't go with that traditional way. Um, another thing that comes out that there's billions, if not trillions of species of bacteria in the ocean, right? Unbelievably diverse. 
So we can go to the, although we never will, but you could technically take our technique to the bottom of the Mariner's Trench and figure out what marine, what marine ba bacteria are there and then grow them out there and then harvest the drugs. There's another rule with marine bacteria, and that what they call the 99.9% .9 rule, that 99.9% .9 of marine bacteria cannot be grown in the lab, right? So you can't grow them in the lab, so you have to grow them in the ocean. And so that's our technique that we've been developing also for a long time. Our kind of, our, our target has been bryostatin. So bryostatin has efficacy against Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, fragile X, anti-cancer activity, and it's used as, a, and it has efficacy against HIV, a viral infection. The problem with the drug is it costs about $20 million a gram, right? Extremely expensive and hard to make in the lab. And it was actually originally extracted from an obscure marine organism called Ugula narantina. It's a bryozoan. But you needed about 14 tons of that odd little invertebrate to get half an ounce of the drug. So that's not a sustainable approach. So we're growing it in the lab. We've already shipped samples over the last two or three years to NIH for testing. Um, and so that's kind of something that we hope to get out there more and more as a way to, to discover new drugs in the ocean. And that's a paper, you can see a couple of the girls in there, Jade and Beth, they talked last year at the VSU symposium and were one of the highlights. So they like, I mean, they, so you can see that dock right there. That's one of the places we do our stuff, right? And then the other one picture is from the Florida Keys. <clears throat> so those are <clears throat> the places that we go. But they were perfectly happy getting in a muck, you know, working with muck. You know, the horse flies didn't bother them. The no seams didn't bother them. Because while those pictures look very ideal, there's nature there, too. It's things in the water that sting you. And so you have to feel comfortable in those environments. And they, they felt comfortable doing stuff in those environments with me. So, um, so let me tell you about COVID. Um, so this, the board right there, right, is during COVID, we worked on, a, we were working on TB to be inhaled, right, tuberculosis. Um, TB is bacteria in your lungs and it slowly dissolves your lungs. So TB and smallpox are the two great killers in the history of humanity. Um, TB has killed one in seven people in the history of the world. Okay. Uh, it's very easily transmittable, right? If you're on a subway like in New York or Washington and you sneeze and you have TB, you can infect up to 40 people from that one sneeze, right? So it's also a concern as a bioterrorism weapon. Um, but the regular TB isn't so bad. It's when you get drug-resistant TB now that's really bad because they cannot treat that at all. Um, so we were working on TB then. And then when COVID came out, we switched to COVID. And in a nutshell, I won't go through all the details, but we ended up having, we ended up publishing a couple of papers on what we were doing. And you can see that one up there, that's one of our papers was posted on the World Health Organization COVID page, right? A doctor in Mississippi picked up our treatment and used it on 83 patients that were very sick, you know, in the ICU on ventilators type of thing. Um, and it had 200 controls and it outperformed all the drugs out there. So we ended up applying to the FDA. So we had an FDA application that some students helped me with, right? And that ended up being about 400 pages total of the application, right? So a lot of detail was required. Um, and they turned us down because we didn't have basically enough money to start a clinical trial. So um, so those clinical trials cost tens of millions of dollars. So we went back to and asked them to pay for it, and they said no. So, um, which wasn't a, an odd comment. It wasn't obnoxious. They have a thing called U.S. Care. It's a program that helps pay for medical emergencies, and we tried to get them to do that. So, and one of their arguments uh, that, that came out of our discussions with them was that we would have a hard time getting the patent on what we're doing, so a big company would not pick it up. So even though it worked, worked on people, um, the whole intellectual property thing played a great role. So, so all right, so this is something we call the shell game. It's a game that we invented that you use shells, right? Um, and it's a simple game to play, but what I found over the years, maybe not everybody, a lot of people like playing with shells. You know, they like looking at them, like, you know, holding them. Uh, we found out with little kids, we found out with older people. And so last semester, we started doing something with a fourth grade class Salas Mahone, where they used a shell game in terms of helping them learn a lot of math, right? So there's these little math games that we play with it, right? Little kids love shells. And even I have so many shells on my back porch, like buckets full, the orange buckets from Home Depot full of shells that, you know, little kids leave, we give them some shells to take home and play with, right? So it's a lot, a lot of kids like that stuff. We've also done it with, so you see on the left, I have four students with me, and we were at a local facility that has patients with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. 
uh, early stages. And this was a game, we're still doing it. Um, we, we play games with them, and they like the shells too, a lot more than I call PCC, plastic crap from China, right? Not allowed to say that, but that whole plastic pieces, plastic everything, I just would rather have a shell that came off a local beach than um, you know, a piece of plastic that came halfway around the world. And so a lot of these, when you sit around with them, start doing this, they start telling you stories. Oh, I remember when I was, you know, 20 years old and I went fishing with my friend and blah, blah, blah. And other ones, oh, I remember we used to clean conch and blah, 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 blah. You get a lot of the stories that come along with it too. You don't get stories with little pieces of plastic that were manufactured, you know, some faraway place. And so we still do that. We play the game. And so it's a memory game, right? You want to jog people's memory, basically. And that slows down any kind of, you know, the dementia, um, Alzheimer's type thing, it slows it down quite a bit. And so the students like doing it. And I think, you know, the show game was great, but I think just having the older people having to talk to some of the younger people is probably just as stimulating also. So, um, and so we, we were there, the last time we did, we were there about two and a half hours, right? And when it wasn't forced, it just kind of flowed. And I have another student group that's going to go back pretty soon too, probably next week or two. So, but that's a game. We, we've done lots of other games. That one just happened to be a little, little neater than some of the others. Last year, I had two students pitch a novel chemistry game we developed to investors in Atlanta. And there was some interest there, but then one of the students transferred to Georgia Tech. The other one wanted to concentrate on pre-med, so it kind of fell. Um, but the game market, this is where the with doing a market analysis comes in. The game market in the United States is $26 million a year. I'm sorry, $26 billion a year, right? So it's a big market. And with homeschooling growing more and more, particularly after the pandemic, that there's educational games are, you know, on a really rapid rise, right? And so we, we're at the right time, right place, but the students that were working on thought that, you know, there were other things that they wanted to concentrate on. So, um, and that is it. I will point, Taylor, are you still out there? Exit. Still here. Oh, okay. So Taylor, why don't you, uh, you did work with me for a, for quite a, quite a while. Why don't you talk a little bit about what your project was, maybe throw in like a little bit about the NSF and the other students and et cetera. Yeah, sure. Can y'all hear me okay? I had to move locations. Um, so I kind of did a, a two part of some of the things that Dr. Manning mentioned. So one thing was kind of looking at the cancer drugs and in the case that I did, I was looking at those cancer drugs in relation to lung cancer specifically. And on top of that, utilizing the method of inhalation, like Dr. Manning mentioned, with like kind of like with the COVID and tuberculosis drugs. So it's kind of a two part there looking at what benefit um, using that Trojan horse effect with those drugs would have on top of using it as a direct treatment for lung cancer. So the general idea was that with lung cancer, since the, um, especially in the early stages, if the cancer is localized to the lungs, if we're, you know, administering this drug that's going to be going systemically, you're going to have, you know, much higher um, side effects due to that systemic effect of the drug. So it was kind of looking at um, if we utilize it specifically to the lungs, hitting the area where the cancer is, you would kind of be able to diminish some of those effects. So Taylor is, she's in med school right now. She's sitting at lunch. Um, and what it called, she did her, she has a, she got a bio, a master's degree in biomedical science. Right. And so that her, a lot of her yes. thesis was done, was done here. So, um, and she, she tell me about the NSF i program real quick. Yeah. So, um, I think it was, we did it this during the summertime. So it was a program through the National Science Foundation and it was sort of, a program that was established so students could explore um, what it would take to develop um, some sort of novel um, drug or application and what it would take to sort of bring that to market. So we were able to talk to different experts in the field and see sort of, you know, where is the research, the research leading people, what is something that's needed. And, you know, if you were to develop this thing is there a chance that it could be possibly brought to market? Because of course it would depend on demand and you know what the research is kind of telling you. So we were able to talk with um, different drug development companies, um, a few experts at different universities, and then cancer 
um, doctors as well through that program. So what you have now, a lot of funding agencies won't just fund research by itself, or you just like work on one specific thing. They want you to show that there's a need for society, that you're solving some problems. And they also want to show that not just that you're telling them that's what it does. They want them for you to go out and meet lots of people that work in that field and see what, what they actually need, not what you think they need, because they can be completely different answers, right? Um, and so when, when Taylor did this, right, we found out lung cancer, if you have diagnosed with lung cancer, 80% chance that uh, you'll pass away in the next four to five years. So the, there are lots of drugs out there, but they don't work very well. Um, and they also like, we were doing work with inhalation um, in terms of direct application as opposed to taking an IV or a tablet. And that would be, that would reduce the, uh, what do you call it, the amount of drug you had to take by about 95% the direct contact, which would reduce side effects. So, um, so Taylor's one, and she worked with, with two students. Ironically, one of them, who's also named is Taylor, just got into med school at Mercer. Right. And so a lot of the students that do, and then Kiana's applying to dental school. So a lot of the students that work on this, this is kind of like a bridge to, you know, what they want to do for the rest of their life. It's not just like a random thing. So Taylor, any other comments? She might be off for lunch break. Now. Okay. Not off the top of my head, but if I think of something before you guys conclude, then I'll pop in. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Do we have some questions? Why not, uh, why not, instead of direct contact, why would we not go to Hale for a lung cancer treatment? Such as that? That's what it was. It was, oh, it was a lung, it wasn't it. Now, what, it's not as simple as you think. It, most inhalers that you use make particles that are pretty big, which means they hit the back of your mouth and the, and the top of your throat. They're not big enough to get into your lungs. I'm sorry, they're too big to get into your lungs. You have to make them very small. And that's what we were doing with the COVID thing. And then with lung cancers, we can make the particles very small, like 15 nanometers, 100 nanometers across, so that they'll penetrate into where your AVR are and actually hit the disease. So if you just had like a normal inhaler or a mask or something like that, it would, it would be non-effective. You had to have a way to get the, 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 the drug inside a small particle and get the small particle way into your lungs. So. So the administration part was part of it. When we talked to oncologists that dealt with lung cancers quite a bit, they were concerned because a lot of drugs are pretty nasty molecules. And if you just did a normal inhaler, it would actually attack your teeth, your tongue, your upper throat. I mean, and it would be like inhaling Clorox or something in some cases. So the getting that small part. And so what Taylor did also, she developed a device, built a device, we built a device that it would go to about here. It was a little bit less than a trach tube, but you wouldn't have to be put under to do it. And it would blast the stuff into your lungs, almost like putting a quick blast into a balloon. And so that way it went f way down to where it was supposed to be. It wouldn't just kind of like come out and, and just, you know, aggregate there. So she had a working model for that. And we had a donation from a company in Germany of a special device that would make the small particles that we wanted to make too. So. Yes. And I can add, I can add to that a little bit too. Um, it was pretty fun to actually work with a vaporizer, and a little bit of what I did was I did preliminary testing using just like a vape pen because the vape pen sort of does the same thing that that larger one does, um, just kind of on a smaller scale. So instead of like an inhaler, you know, just kind of injecting particles, it's using convection and conduction. So those two principles allow you to get a small particle size so that when you are inhaling it, you're making sure that it gets down to the lowest levels of the lung. So it's a lot of fun to be able to do that and to work with a vaporizer. Yeah, a lot of times when you do this, you don't, you don't go out and get the biggest thing because you think you have a great idea. You start small and see if stuff works. And so those little vape pads that people vape with, so they actually do a pretty good job converting things into the gas phase. And so that was our first kind of toy to play with to get an idea because what we wanted to see if we had, like, say, a protein, would the protein go into the droplet and then be able to move or would it be too heavy? So we did things like with different types of proteins, different types of medications, and see if we could move them around like that. So, And then once that started working, then we went to bigger, more expensive stuff that, you know, what companies got involved. So someone over here had a... Oh, yeah, I was listening in on my way. Um, I was very interested in when you were talking about the cancer cells, mm -hmm. and instead of 
um, like, you know, just killing them all, but just like feeding them. Mm -hmm. When uh, could we expect to see like clinical trials with that type of thing? Well, right now we're, we're in preclinical trials with it, right? And so our next jump is going to be up to be like a, like a phase that's in between preclinical trials and clinical trials where you focus on one specific, you can't just go and say, I'm going to cure all cancer. Right. You have to pick a, we're going to go after pancreatic just because there's such a need, but it has at least like a 97% mortality rate. And when people have that, I've known a couple of people that have passed away from that. That's, a, you know, I mean, all cancers are terrible, but that one's terrible too. I mean, it, it agonizes you for a year or so before, you know, things go south. And so we're, that's our next thing into them is to focus on that. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll point this out. Does anyone here know what a HeLa, H-E-L-A cell line is? So there's a famous cancer cell line. It was taken out of a woman. I forget the exact date, but it was something like the 1940s. I think she had breast cancer. They took out some breast cancer cells, put them in a Petri dish. She ended up passing away from breast cancer. They kept reproducing. So today you can go out and buy HeLa cells from that woman passed away in whatever the year was, 1946, 1951, I don't remember, um, that are still reproducing. So cancer cells technically can live forever, right? They just keep reducing. They don't die off. Like healthy cells, a certain number of them die off every day. And so that gives you kind of a, an example of how powerful cancer can be. When you can put them in a Petri dish, and 50 years later, they're still around, right? 60 years later, they're still around. But that's a famous cell line, H-E-L-A. It has an interesting history. Because you have, to, you have to put things in the context of that time, right, in, in terms of what people did. But the woman's family came back like 40 years later and said, hey, you know, why didn't you ever ask her about what you were doing? And we said, well, you know, we just took cells from different people and we tried them. And, you know, it, it wasn't as legalized as it is now. I mean, what the, what the doctors did was very decent and helped a lot of people. But, um, but there was, there's a lot of stuff when you have things like that happen with there's regulations put in place because of it. You learn a lot from it, and the HeLa cells are class. There's books written about it. So I think the woman was from Virginia, if I remember right. But but um, but interesting story there. So other questions? I, would, and I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Um, when I came here from another institution about 20 years ago, um, and started working on the undergraduate research council. It, your programs and the way you adapted your teaching to real world experiences and real world problems, I have to say, inspired me to try and do some of that. It was a little bit more difficult in humanities mm -hmm. to kind of tackle that, but I've always liked that idea of having students do more than just read it a text yeah. but to be more involved yeah um, do you have any words of advice though for other colleges because in the in the sciences and maybe the social sciences that sort of adaptive model seems to work better but for humanities it's a little more difficult um I, well, i'll say this i mean it's like in say my my son's in political science and uh, at uga and he spends a lot of his time working for warnock the senator mm -hmm. Right. So that may not be exactly what I'm doing, but, you know, he's meeting a lot of people. He's seen how politics work. He's starting to learn how politicians do what politicians do. You know, he's seeing the other side of it. And I think that's kind of the bottom line with a lot of this. With this, if you read how to do a simple problem in a textbook, that's great, but that doesn't teach you. And if you go into a lab and you learn how to do a simple technique, that doesn't mean you're, you're just given a couple of little tools that you might use to solve a problem. But you're not solving the problem. Right. And so that's like, you know, if you memorize all the presidents of the United States, that's great, but that's not going to make you a politician, right? You have to learn the tools that the politician uses, you know, how do they get along with people? Who are their go-to important people? Who do they ignore? I mean, there's a lot of, probably a lot of stuff there that we don't realize, or we don't want to realize, you know, and uh, that you learn when you actually do it with them. So I just say it's the function of real world experience in your field. So it makes a lot more than, um, you know, reading a PowerPoint slide. So. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I, I really do. And um, it's funny because now, of course, experiential learning has become the name of the game. But that kind of uh, work has been going on for a very long time in education. But what I'm finding now is that it helps bridge the gap with students because they're coming out of K through 12 
even before COVID, but now definitely with COVID, with very limited skills. Yeah. And and especially in problem solving. Yeah. And and so. Um, and it's also adapting to the workplace, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times, like students that work with me, I don't want to say I harass them, but I'm definitely pushing them. I mean, Taylor's probably gotten you know, 57 emails at 11 o'clock at night to say, hey, don't forget you have to do this at 8 a.m. type of thing, right? Um, and a lot of, but I've talked to people that hire college graduates and they're like, well, they want to tell me what time they're going to show up, what time they leave, what outfits they want to wear. And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't work like that, you know? So, um, and, and so this is kind of a, like a, a reality. And a lot of people like it. They like trying to say, I want to work on this. I want to solve something. As opposed to just saying, okay, I have 47 PowerPoint slides I have to memorize by tomorrow. Type right. Thing. So right. But, it seems more engaging. I don't know. What do you all think? Is it more interesting that way? Are you willing to do the readings behind it? Because I, I find students are not willing to do a lot of readings. Yeah. I think application is like the most important of it. If I need context to understand the application, then I'll go back to it as a reference. So it's more like that. Okay, so you're more apt to read about your project if you're involved in it. That absolutely makes a big difference. Yeah. I mean, it's like we're doing cancer stuff. I don't know. Uh, that said, it's my responsibility not to hand them a 50 page paper and say read it by tomorrow. Right. right? I mean, it's, so you kind of, it comes in dribbles. Well, I'll say, they read this title, abstract, and intro, you know, go over it a couple times tonight. And it can be a lot of stuff in there, right? So it's not a quantity thing. It's that you, there's two or three or four thing, key points that you pick up. And then you just, you don't do it for 12 hours a day. I mean, if you just put it becomes part of your, your, your lingo where you're looking at this and looking at that. You're not just there like a robot, you're doing repetitive tasks. So, yeah. Know. I've especially had um, success, like right now I'm doing social and political philosophy. And so we're doing that, and I'm finding that students are much more engaged when when we're talking about you know the real world experiences of what they need to do and how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, so I was very inspired when I got here um, by all you did, and one of the big ones that stands out. I think you were involved in this. Yeah, I, I think you were in the pigs. The decomposing pigs, or was that biology? That's biology. Was it biology? Yeah. I know they're up there. Yeah. We're on a fourth floor. We, we do our oyster work in one greenhouse, and they have these deep, disgusting decomposing pigs in one next door. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I remember sitting on the, the panel, because one of the things, if you guys aren't involved in the symposium, you really should be. It's great fun. And you get to learn all these different things from all the different ones. But I do remember having to sit through the decomposing pig thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was rough. So well, someone once, there was, it was a good analogy. They said, everybody knows a guy or two that's an ultra fan of football, baseball, or basketball, right? He knows all sorts of stats, you know, who, who won this in 1975, who was the MVP in 19. I mean, just, just knows it inside and backwards. You hand him a football, hand him a basketball, hand him a baseball, he can't play, yeah. right? And so that the idea is that, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a hobby and it keeps him busy, nothing wrong with that. But the point is, if you want to play, you got to learn how to play, yeah. right? You can't memorize a whole bunch of stuff about it, right? They're two different things. I think a lot of times academia goes to that, you know, let's remember, I want to be a fan, yeah. I, I don't want to be a player type of thing, so. Yeah, we run into that a lot in, in philosophy because the methodology of philosophy is logic. And logic, people don't want to learn it. Yeah. It, it gets boring and it's it's no fun and it's really kind of it's just game theory. It's, it's the basis of game theory. And and once you sort of show them how it fits in, then it becomes more meaningful. Yeah. But I even know a lot of people who teach philosophy that don't do don't make their students do logic, mm -hmm. which I find amazing. So I'll say that one of the things that comes out of Taylor is a great example, um, like. She, she wants to go into medicine and she can recite, you know, people in her family that were sick, friends that were sick, and she wants to be someone that can help make that not happen. I mean, she cares right. about it, there's passion there. And I, I don't think you'd get that, that you know, that, that level, unless you have experience with it, right? Yeah. So if she was raised in a tech, you know, in an apartment by herself and never saw sort a of sick person, she probably wouldn't want to become a doctor or nurse, she probably gross her out, right? Yeah. And, but she's been through that, and, you know, just, you know, as, as a citizen, 
type of thing. And she decided this is what I'm, this is what I want to do in my life. I want to you know, help these people. Um, and you don't, and I don't think you get that passion unless you have that experience. So, yeah. and then that can't be delivered in a sterile way. You have to have the humanity of it behind it. So, no, I, I think I agree with you because I find it when uh, even talking about we were talking about what what is a human. Um, you get different responses from different people, but it is interesting their backgrounds that come into it that play into what they think a human is. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So are you a you know are you a consumer? Yeah. I mean that's like the generic now. You know, how much stuff do you get from Amazon every day? Yeah. And how much do you make? And you know where are you? You know helping the world be a better place. So, yeah. You know. We do it with uh, the terms develop and develop and developing yeah those are the big terms now that we don't do third world and that kind of stuff um and it's funny because when we talk about being developed in the united states it, one it makes you sound like you're done you get no place to go but it's all about technology yeah and but if we turn it around um many of the the cultures around the world that don't have any technology are more developed than we are when it comes to environment yeah. And living in, in harmony with the environment. So that makes us the developing country rather than them. Yeah. And so and that's probably pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we do a lot of trash. Yeah. A lot of those. Well, any other questions? We're about out of time and I know people have to get I wanted to ask as far as like getting into research and like joining your team and working with things like that, like when do you recommend people join that as far as like their academic journey like how like what classes what well i'll say Paige is in her first year and she's working with me now i've had students work with me two three four years um part of its passion the other thing the reality, the reality of it is it's resume builder right so if you want to do something like let's just say you want to go to georgetown law school you know if you graduate with 3.2 and you're in a political science club your senior year you're not even going to be remotely considered right you have a high GPA and you've been doing all sorts of interesting things for the last four years. You make connections, you have some publications. Now you're in the hunt, right? So there's a lot of things that people want to do that they're not waiting for you. They're not going to give you a big hug when you show up. You have to really fight to get your way in to be very competitive. And that's what it, that's the other part that people see, right? But it's not, they're not doing it just because it's resume fodder. They're doing it because they like doing it and it will help me on what I want to do for the rest of my life. So. That's why I say it can be very early. I have had high school kids do research projects with me. So I'm pretty good at customizing things. That I just got something. Oh, Jimbo Plant just emailed me about a student coming over from another country. I forget which country. But it's like, like I forget, maybe Czechoslovakia. Maybe it was Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And she wanted to do research in medicine. And if I had anything, I said, yeah, definitely adapt something to it. And so a lot of that, you just, you know, you have to be kind of ambitious about it and then fall through on it. So. But don't view it as just doing research saying, hey, I'm starting to work my way into what I want to do for the rest of my life. So that I, I, that's how I would view it. So it's a stepping off point. So Yeah, and you can use um, the symposium and other things like that to start. So I start a lot of my students with posters before they do their oral presentations because they're a little nervous about, I don't want to get them to speak. Um, so yeah, you can start your freshman year and you can do a couple of projects and move on and then eventually it be, it, research becomes almost addictive. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to say that, but once you, you start having success in the research in your field, you kind of want to keep going with it and get into different ideas and different projects. There was a project that was done here between like art and um, chemistry. Was it art and chemistry, or art and biology with the C? Oh, we were doing that. That, yeah. was, that was chemistry, yeah. yeah. And that was fabulous. So occasionally you can get these projects going across disciplines, you know, so how do you apply art to all the work down in, you know, in the, in the ocean? And that was, that well, was amazing. What that was, everyone has a cell phone camera now, right? We're pretty good cameras. And so everybody likes taking pictures. And I said, okay, so let's think of an art form that nobody has done, which you'd say that's impossible. You can't do it. And I said, yes, we can. And so we go down to the Florida Keys, we're in all these little pools of water that have all this little teeming life. I said, what we're going to do is we're going to make the little invertebrates that live in here into an art form, right? I'm going to take pictures. And you start, when you zoom in, you start seeing some of the structure there. It's really neat. 
and you don't even know that you're looking at a little kabuka buka, whatever the heck it is. I don't know what most of them are. I mean, that's the biologist black man yeah. world. So I just, it's a little thing. I'm sure it doesn't sting you. Um, <laughs> and so they take pictures, and we have all these, you see them up on the third floor, some of them, these different pictures. Uh, but the, the students really got into that. There was a handful of students like, wow, you think anyone will buy this? I'm like, probably, but, you know, probably not. But, you know, because there's so much stuff out there. But it was something that, from a science point of view, that I picked up on was, wow, they spend a lot of time, just spent three hours in that little pool of water taking pictures of all the little creatures that live there, trying to identify them, you know, and they were all really into it. It wasn't like I was forcing them to stay there. And so that ended up being a really good learning experience, too. So... But there's a lot of odd things you, you can come up with if you're creative. So like they say with Amazon, no one knew they needed Amazon until Amazon showed up, right? Yeah. No one was saying we need a big company to take our stuff home for us, you know, that kind of thing, until they showed up. Now you're like, how do we possibly do without it? So, so you have to find that thing. If you're looking for like a unique idea, you have to find that thing that nobody knows they need, but they really do need. And Amazon's a classic business example. Yeah. So. I'm still waiting for a student. I've been trying to sell a student. On crossing over between um, indigenous science on uh, natural geometry and projects like uh, the the camera one, because there's a lot of uh, natural science done in indigenous groups that is and was far more advanced earlier on than what we had in the West, um, but a lot of it gets discounted. Yeah. Because of it. And so I'm, I'm still waiting. I've talked to a few students and hopefully some of them will eventually pop up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. You, you talk to your professors, see see what interests you, see what they're willing to help with. Um, but you do have to get out there and do most of the, the legwork in, in terms of finding your projects. And then we'll help you. And I showed you, I mean, everyone knows about healthcare to some extent, but I showed you a picture of the docs there. So there's some people that just love that, right? And they love that we're doing, you know, it's like an exploratory thing. They're in the water. Yeah, I don't care that there's a shark nearby. I don't care if I get bit by a, you know, stingray, who knows what. They just like being there. And I can't teach that, right? That's just something that, you know, maybe their you know, mom and dad took them to the beach all the time or a little who knows what. And there's other people that don't want to come within 10 feet of the water, right? And so I don't push them off the end of the dock because it's funny. I just say, well, if you really don't want to be able to find something else for it. Yeah. You know, so you try to find a thing that you just naturally say, that's something I want to do. Or it's, you know, if you have to force yourself to do it, it's probably not going to work out. You're probably going to end up just after a while, I'm going to come in today, I'm going to come in tomorrow. Yeah, I'll just go to the gym and play basketball. Who knows what, you know, and next thing you know, it's all over. So but thanks a lot, Taylor. Oh, bye, Taylor. Yeah, yeah they should also they have a class in this classroom. Yeah. Oh, okay, then we better get going. Going here. to classroom yeah. one. Thank you all for being here. Sure. Thank you, uh, everybody online. It was good to see you. Thank you for talking to us. Well, thank That's you. That's always for very me. inspiring. Yeah. And for those of you who want it, this is going to be up online. It's been recorded. So.